Welcome back to the To Be Better podcast. Before we get into the intro, we have a little bit of a disclaimer that we need you to hear. We are not the experts of your life. You are. We believe that most relationships can be saved. However, both parties have to want it and both parties have to be willing to do the work. So we speak in generalizations. If it applies to 90% of the population and you're part of the 10% that it doesn't, it can be adapted to fit the narrative you're going with. And it's up to you to make that adaptation. It's not up, up to us to cater to every single living being on the planet. We just want to get the information out there and you can make it applicable to your life as you see fit. So whether you decide to stay or decide to leave, you still have to make the changes that are necessary to grow. If you fail to do the work, you're going to fail in your next relationship. So why not do the work now before quitting? All right. So in emailing us, you are asking us for our unbiased, unfiltered opinions. If you're not ready to hear our opinions, do not email us. And there are certain topics that we will not discuss on this podcast, such as domestic violence, SA, or other assaults and addiction. Or children being abused. Speaking of the emails, if you guys are going to send us an email, please be as detailed as possible. Take a second to proofread what you have sent and make sure that you have punctuation, because if you have one long paragraph that is a run-on sentence and it is a difficult thing for us to read, we're not going to sit down and retype your email just for us to be able to read it on the podcast. It will get moved into a rejected folder and we will never see it. And last but not least, if you're not interested in having your, your email read on our podcast, do not submit an email. We do not do direct emailing answers. It is a scratch our back. You, we scratch yours. You send email for our content. We give you the, the opinions that you're asking for. And uh, if you would like to have your email submitted, you can send it to to be better co at gmail.com. The number two, be better co at gmail.com. And we are back. We're back. Episode 24. 24. I feel like we just did 23 yesterday. It was two days ago, actually. <laughs> but it's edited, yeah, posted, and ready to go, scheduled. So that's done, at least. I like being ahead. Me too, because it makes me feel like if you were like, I really don't want to do this today, mm-hmm. I'd be like, okay, I'm going to find something else that I can do. Yeah. Um, which I did. Uh, what, Wednesday, right? I don't Thursday? remember. Thursday? I don't Once. know. Whatever day it was. Today's Friday, so it was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. So there were things that you wanted to talk about? Uh, well, I had things in the book that I wanted to talk about. Okay. But you said you had points that you wanted to talk about. I do about. have points. Okay. So do you remember we've had, of course you remember, we've had several conversations of the thoughts that you have manifest in your reality. Right. Thoughts become things. Correct. So I was thinking this morning, let me pull up my notes. So it's not just the words that you speak to yourself. It's the tone that you use when you speak to yourself. So you could be using positive words, but if your tone is shitty, you're not going to get the only thing I can think of as the full effect of being positive. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, because your heart's not in it and you're just kind of regurgitating things to. Right. And the reason I had that thought was this morning, (laughs) you looked at me and you're like, you're being kind of shitty. I was like, no, because I felt like I was doing pretty okay in my head because I wasn't like being negative. I was trying to sort through my things, but I was agitated and frustrated. And because I was thinking in that tone, unknowingly, I spoke that way out loud. Yeah. So I think, why oh, are you looking at me like that? Because you really, you really did come across super shitty this morning. I'm so sorry. It was so bad that I had to ask you if I cheated on you in your dreams or something last night because you were. I'm you, sorry. You were pretty in it. I didn't I really, when I said it like that, I thought I was just having like normal conversation with you. Not a big deal. We worked through it. I know. It's just, I never correlated the tone that I'm speaking to myself in my mind. I will subconsciously use that in the real world. Right. Like there's no filter there until you pointed it out to me. And I was like, holy shit. Also, I can't remember what I was listening to or what triggered this thought, but this is separate from what I just said. And it's saying apparently is taking away the accountability of the situation. Using the term, apparently. Right. So if something's being discussed and the wife goes, you did X, Y, and Z, and it hurt my feelings. 
and it's resolved or whatever. And then later on it gets brought back up again. He goes, apparently I hurt your feelings. That is the disconnect between I'm acknowledging that what I did to hurt your feelings. And I'm just saying apparently because that's your perspective. That's not how I view it at all. And I'm not going to take the accountability for the things that I did. I see that. I can see that. At what point does that, you know that you're not always going to see eye to eye with your person. Right. And in a scenario where you don't see eye to eye and your person is upset by something that you did and you feel like they're overreacting Mm -hmm. or you didn't do that. At what point do you just say, okay, I can, I can either have it out and like really argue this out or go, this really isn't going to be a big deal in a week. I should just apologize for it. Right. Let them get over it and move the fuck past it. Because saying apparently and getting that tone back Mm -hmm. is a decision. You're making a choice. It is. I remembered what triggered that thought. The apparently thing. Because I was standing out there. I was doing my workout this morning for my shoulders. And I knew that I wanted to bring up and make the point of it's not just the words that you think. It's the tone in which you think that can bleed out into your reality. And... Like I said, I was listening to something they said apparently when correlating to something that they did uh, did affecting somebody. And I was like, could you imagine if I was on the podcast and I was like, apparently I was super shitty this morning. Oh, yeah. That takes away because I texted you. While I, was, I was out there working. I was like, you know, I really appreciate you pointing out the fact that I got shitty with you. And I'm sorry that that happened. I'm going to try to keep it in check better. That is a whole lot better than saying, apparently I got shitty this morning. Right. Well, yeah, that changes. I mean, everything about that changes the entire way our conversation went. Right. Because we didn't, none of that actually, like we didn't have a, that's not how our conversation went at all. So everybody knows when you, you you did get shitty this morning, you like, you had a, you had a fuck you tone when you were speaking and I'm like, babe, are you okay? Right. Like I wasn't like. Don't fucking talk to me like that. No, you didn't. Because I, I could tell something was wrong. Yeah. And it was six o'clock in the morning. Like, did I like like kick you in my sleep last night? Like, what? We've been awake for 15 minutes. Right. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, I just woke up going through it today. And I didn't recognize that it was that bad until you pointed it out to me. Right. But I could have just let it happen. Yeah. Not said anything as it progressed throughout the day and gotten worse or it built, built up. I could have said something and been shitty about it. Mm-hmm. But had we had that discussion and it was as calm as it was, and then we had another discussion and you hit it with apparently out of an attitude this morning. Yeah. You're right. The apparently does make it nasty, but that changes the entire outlook of the conversation that we had. Mm -hmm. Like wording it that way. Had you came in here and sat down and said that, I'd have been like, what the fuck? Right. Right. Yeah. Something I've never thought about before. Yeah. Your words matter. Your thoughts matter because Mm -hmm. they do become your words. I don't know. How did that feel for random thoughts of it, the day? Um, it, it gave me something to think about because yeah. I, I am one of those people who I will meticulously pick my words. Yeah. You know, think before you speak is a big deal for me. Mm-hmm. And and there there are times that I it'll sound really fucking good in my head and I'll say it out loud. And I was like, that was not it. Yeah. Like, I should not have said that. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you know, I'll either mm-hmm. cut it or I'll leave it in there and be like, well, this is going to trigger a whole lot of people on TikTok, you know, and just keep moving. But yeah. Um, well, you said that I had things that I wanted to talk about this morning, and like, I, I only thing I can remember is that book. But while you were talking, it dawned on me that I wanted to talk about my clothing. Okay. I'm going to plug Relentless, <clears throat> Relentless Defender first. For those of you who like my Pugitsu shirt, I walked into the tattoo shop to yeah. grab those stickers, and um, Jewel was look in there, and he's like, dude, I love that t-shirt. And I'm like, yeah, man, when in doubt, fucking shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody in the shop just looked at me. I was like, I'm just here for my stickers, guys. <laughs> um, I have spent the last seven months wearing basketball shorts, flip-flops, and T-shirts. comfortable shirts. Mm-hmm. And when we were mm-hmm. training hev- heavy and, like, I lost a bunch of my weight, I started wearing tighter-fitting shirts, and, like, I was feeling good about it. I had a panic attack in a T-shirt the other day. Yeah. Like full on sweats. Like it took me probably 45 minutes to cool off. It was mm-hmm. not a pleasant scenario. It's the first time I've ever had a panic attack from clothing. Um, and it's because I've put on a little bit more size. I'm a little bit more hefty in the stomach. But the issue was the chest and the arms. It wasn't my gut. Right. Um, anyways, I've noticed that because we have a third camera now, mm-hmm. I am dressing like a normal human being again. I'm not just wearing house clothes because I'm wearing my boots. And I'm wearing my jeans and I put my rings on and like I'm, I'm, I actually thought about putting on one of my expensive watches today just because 
put on a hat. Fuck it. Like, I, you know, I have a bunch of them. I just don't ever really wear them because they never go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We talked last night or yesterday on, I think it was the, it was a Patreon video where we, we talked about like when you're really going through it, change your clothes. Mm-hmm. I, I'm realizing that I am shifting who I am right now. Was I right? Yeah. Change your clothes. Right. But you were. Yeah. Um, I agreed with you yesterday because of the panic attack. Right. So no matter what I felt between other than that, because of the way I felt wearing that t-shirt and how panicky I was, like I agree with you on all of it. But realizing that I have been in the same basketball lounge clothes for a long time has made me feel less of a man. Like I feel like a lazy bum. Yeah. Because I don't have to get dressed anymore. Like I'm 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 good enough financially with my businesses that I can deal with my managers. I don't have to deal with clients. I can look like a piece of shit. No one would ever know. Mm-hmm. I mean they would know when they see me, but the fuck was that? Discord. Oh, I got to turn that off. Okay. I obviously have it open on that computer. Let me do that, and then I'll get back to my thought, because there's a whole lot in that, that thought. I promise this is actually going somewhere, so bear with me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so getting dressed today, um, I actually started doing it last Friday, because I thought we were going to go see that musical, and plans ended up making it so that can't be a thing, and I know that we're going next Friday. And um, we have plans to go to the movies tomorrow night. And like mm-hmm. normally, I'd go to the movies wearing my flip flops and my, bi- my my basketball shorts. Like it's a movie theater; I don't have to get dressed up for that. Or I'll wear my dicky shorts. Like I don't have to do. Yeah, plus I've never seen you wear basketball shorts. No, to the movie theater. No. Well, I had full intention of doing so when I bought those tickets. Yep. Yeah. And I wouldn't have let you leave the house like that. So, um, I got dressed, mm-hmm. and like I, I left the house today and did a couple things, ran some errands, and like. I ran the first half of my errands in my basketball shorts and flip flops. Mm -hmm. And I did my second half later dressed like I am right now. And I felt good about being in public. Now the shift that I'm talking about is because I'm, I'm feeling good in my clothes again. Like I want to wear my, my clothes. I don't want to just wear basketball shorts and Mm t-shirts. The correlation that I had between the two is that I know that I'm, I'm obviously coming out. We know that um, your mental health will affect your hygiene. Correct. And, and I know that when I'm starting to get depressed, I will, to try to shower less frequently. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen. You you don't allow that shit to happen. You you know, like I, I tell you flat out, like, hey, I didn't shower yet. So then you're like, go. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want to. And you're like, I don't fucking care. Mm-hmm. And you have to mom me a little bit because otherwise I'll sit in front of the computer and I'll edit or I'll make excuses or I'll order food and we'll watch TV and then it'll be 1130 at night. And I'm like, damn, I didn't take a shower today. And you'd be like, what? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I have to allow you to mom me a little bit. But I, I know that when that starts happening, that's my depression kicking in. Mm-hmm. And I'm starting to realize that there was a level of comfort and maybe and the stress and uncertainty of where our lives were kind of added to that for me a little bit. So subconsciously, there's been that static the entire time which is why i haven't been dressing the way that i normally do um there's also a comfort to it it really is a comfort to it basketball shorts and a t-shirt wearing flip-flops like come on this everybody oh, yeah. likes that shit how many women this is where this was going how many women that are stay-at-home moms don't get dressed up anymore they don't have to i would say majority of them they're stay at home they can wear sweatpants they can wear house slippers they can mm-hmm. wear pajama jeans or leggings and a t-shirt and an oversized hoodie if that's what they want to do. And like, they don't have to get dressed anymore. And you get so, so used to that and you lose your femininity because you're not, you're dressing like a fucking boy at that point. Like mm-hmm. <clears throat> that, um, the realization for me and that, that whole thing that hit me today with the way that I'm dressed today versus the way I was dressed yesterday. Um, I don't want to go back to that. I want to make it a point to get up, do my workout, get dressed. And even if I don't leave the house, like I want to still look presentable while I'm here because I do think that's going to directly affect the way I feel about myself. I agree. So um, we talked a little bit yesterday because you you are a stay-at-home wife. And, I am. And you do still get dressed up mm-hmm. every single day. Does it ever get old for you? No. Is it because you actually enjoy getting dressed up or because you like the way you look? or like- I like the way it makes me feel. I, I honestly don't care to look at myself in the mirror. I don't enjoy seeing me. So when I get dressed, it is purely to make me feel like I'm an adult. And it's also for you to have something nice to look at. Right. Well, and you do that really well. I know. To clarify, he would still gawk at <laughs> me in sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> I look really good in sweatpants. So you would still gawk at me and like do the whole thing. 
you fell in love with me during that dating phase though. Mm. And I put my best foot forward. I am not going to take that step back and I'll be like, I landed him. Now I'm just, I'm going to bum it for the rest of my life. You know how many women do that though? A lot. Yeah. I got him now. What's the point in getting, getting done up? No. Those are also the same women who say they don't get done up for the man. They do it for themselves. Mm-hmm. But they did it to catch the man. Now they got the man. They're not doing it for themselves anymore. I cannot tell you how amazing it feels to get dressed up the way that I do and for you to go, that's my fucking woman. Yeah. Yeah. That feels really good. Do you think that that affects your mental health? What? All of it. The yes. getting dressed up, the complimenting, the, the yeah. adulting. Definitely. We, we talked about choice theory a lot. This, uh, this is my second time through this book. Mm-hmm. I missed this this part last time. Those five or six pages. I don't know how the fuck I missed them, but I didn't retain any of it. And when I heard it today, I paused it and was like, <gasps> and I was yeah. like, fuck it, I'm calling her. Um, that discussion of choice therapy, we talked about it last night in the Five Apology Love Languages live stream when we had the uh, question, the Q&A that we talk about with people with the do super chats towards the end of the, the live streams. Uh, somebody asked about how they get over their depression and fight through it when they're feeling the way that they're feeling. And we were like, it's a choice. Mm. And like, we've talked about it and we'll talk about it more when we actually dive through that book in a deep dive, but or a breakdown. Am I not reading this? No, we are. We're going to go through that. Yeah. But I don't want, uh, we're going to do that as like a whole series. Like we're doing the the love languages, but there's one thing in there I want to touch on because it's super fucking prevalent to the emails that we get. Mm -hmm. Um, But the person that sent that through is somebody that's in discord somebody that we talk to all the time. And like last night I was like, it's a choice. You have to make a decision to do things that's going to better your mental health. And I didn't realize how much just simply getting dressed, like truly getting dressed will do that. Yeah. Because you get so used to just being in your comfortable clothes. Mm-hmm. That's not normal. You you know, if you don't like the way you look and you're doing it solely for comfort, mm-hmm. you're missing half of the reason that you get dressed up. You know what right. I mean? Like, yeah. I don't know. That's why... I have been so adamant about getting dressed up and doing my makeup and doing my hair and looking nice because I, I still have like a day or two a week where I don't do anything. I just walk around looking like a straight bum in my workout leggings or whatever. Almost every day the last few weeks, I have thought I don't want to put any effort into how I look. I'm not going to wear makeup. I'm going to wear an oversized t-shirt and I'm wearing my house slippers and I don't want to, I don't want to put any effort into me. That is my depression, and I know that that's my depression. Because when I am not going through that, I love getting dressed up. I love feeling good in my body, especially because I fucking hate it in here. Yeah. <laughs> so I go out of my way to pamper my skin and make my hair soft and take care of my facial skin and brush my teeth, and I go above for my hygiene. I can't remember where I was going with that. I just started thinking about all of my skincare routines. I, I'm, you were talking about your mental health and how it makes you feel good to do it. And you do it to help fight your depression. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So even this morning, I was like, I, I went out and got my nails done. And I wore this dress and stuff. And I was the only person dressed like this in there. How many people were out there wearing leggings and oversized shirts? So the nail salon was packed this morning. I never make an appointment to get my nails done because my life is so unpredictable. Right. So I just go when I can go and I got there 20 minutes after they opened and they already had 25 people in there. Holy fuck. How many people work there? Um, I would say I would say 25 to 30. So Everybody was, had somebody. Okay. So it was slammed. Yes. The manager stopped what he was doing to do my nails for me. Hmm. I tipped him $25. So to my question though, how yeah. many of the women that were in there were actually dressed appropriately instead of just... What do you mean appropriately? not looking like they rolled out of bed, threw on comfortable clothes and left because that's how I've been living my life for Um, seven months. Out of all of the women I saw. Seven seven months. Holy shit. Like actual outfits put together. I'd say maybe two outside of me. And both of them are older women. You know, we get emails all the time where women are asking you, what can you do to stay in your feminine because they don't like doing their hair and nails or they don't like wearing makeup. Mm. And I think that there's so much more to being a woman than simply your appearance. Mm. Um, it's the way that you carry yourself. Patron. Patron. Um, I'm not going to do it now. Okay. But I think. Too many pauses are happening. Patron. So I need to just say my thought <laughs> okay. before we move on. Go. It's gone. We got two in a row. What were you just saying? I need you to repeat that. That was a really good point I had. We were talking about people getting dressed and then talking about femininity. And okay. It's back. So for the women who don't like doing their makeup, you can still have a skincare routine. 
there's a way to out of that doughy look that everyone replicates with makeup, you can do that with just a natural skincare routine. I don't know what that is. It's I don't know how to explain dewy. Okay. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I'm just telling you, I don't know yeah. what that is. So have a skincare routine. Um, do conditioner masks for your hair. <clears throat> you can use, they have the serum for your lashes to help detangle them and help them grow so they look fuller and longer. You can do that instead of wearing mascara and just enhance your natural lashes with a little bit of help. You can do, I have little silicone socks that I put on with lotion. Take care of your feet. Use lotion on your body. Take a bath and use an, ex, an exfoliating exfoliating scrub to get rid of all the dead skin. Mm. You don't have to do your hair. You don't have to get your hair done and do your makeup and get your nails done and go get pedicures and be the superficial whatever. There, there's different levels of femininity. And I would say that first one is just start taking care of yourself a little bit better. Yeah. The amount of women that, that email in, they're like, I'm a tomboy. Mm-hmm. How do okay. I be more feminine? And, and I always I always want to respond to them that, you you know, just because of your physical preferences mm-hmm. doesn't mean that you can't be feminine. There are fucking cowgirls that are feminine, that, that like actually ranch, that are feminine. Yeah. You know, I know I know women who are welders and work blue collar jobs that are super feminine when they're not at work. And if you if you are one of those tomboys and you have that masculine side of you, you need to find a man that's got more masculine energy than you do and mm-hmm. allow yourself to fall back into that femininity a little bit. So that you can be that tomboy around everyone but your man, because ultimately that's what fucking matters. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I was plugging Relentless Defender earlier because of my T-shirt, and I forgot to say that if you use the code to be better on their website, you'll get fifteen percent off. I'm super proud of that because I have like, I want to, I yeah, I have almost all over their shirts. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. I tried to get till Valhalla Project, but they won't even respond to my emails. I mean, I get it, but I I don't. I have a not to. This is going to sound arrogant. But between the two of us, we have 1.5 million followers. Yeah. 60,000 followers on YouTube. I, uh, we had 200,000 downloads in the month of April mm. for our podcast. You would think that it would be beneficial to them to at least respond. So, You want to get into the choice theory? I, I really do. Okay. I, I, guys, this book, uh, who wrote that book? So this is Choice Theory by William Glasser, MD. We, we have, we have had... The amount of therapists that have reached out to us and told us how great of a job we're doing. Oh, that's so validating. Is high. Sex therapist. um, Social workers. Social workers. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. an actual psychiatrist. We have gotten a lot of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of fucking emails from from people who are like, hey, I recommended your podcast to my therapist. And then we'll get an email from the therapist. Yeah. Um, Our check-in list is now being handed out by therapists for people to try if they're in marriage counseling to like, hey, this is, you know, try this. Mm -hmm. Um. But this book came from a therapist in Orlando, a uh, psychiatrist. And she actually said that if we ever come across something that is too big for us, that we can refer them to her and she would help them. But I have read this book twice now and I was reading it again today and I fucking heard this chapter and I was like, there's no way that I'm going to let this ride without talking about this individually on the podcast. Okay. So this is the workless. Mm, workless. Workless. Mm. Work less. The workless. Workless. Yeah. When you say work less, it sounds like two words. Workless. Workless. Yeah. The workless person is the most... Pul- the whole lot of p- going on there. P- p- the workless person is the most puzzling of all the people we encounter. He easily relates to others and, at first, you may easily relate to him. But if you choose, if you marry him, you will become increasingly frustrated. There may be women among the workless, but they are less visible because it is still more accepted in our society for a woman not to work and to be supported. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to read this book. It's so good. Unlike a sociopath who quickly shows his true colors, the workless person goes about what he does slowly. You may get deeply involved before you realize who you are involved with. Do you think someone to do that longer than two years? Yes, uh, and he does get into that. Wow. The um for you guys, if you if what we're doing interests you, there will be a link to the description in this in our um, video. It is an Amazon affiliate link. We will get a kickback if you buy the book, mm-hmm. but there will be a link to it. I'm going to actually message AJ right now to make sure that it's in there. Okay. Also, he doesn't prey on you directly. You are hurt more by what he doesn't do than 
by what he does. You are more hurt by what he doesn't do than by what he does. But in the end, because of your longer involvement with him that may take up years of your life, he may hurt you more than the year or less of adventure. But in the end, because of your longer involvement with him that may take up years of your life, he may hurt you more than the year or less of adventure that you will have if you survive with most sociopaths. It's not this, this is the chapter before this or the part before this talks about sociopaths, which is why he keeps bringing it up right now. So it's not really relevant to mm. the point that I want to make when you read this chapter. Um, but he said that of all the personality types on the in the world, these are the two that you absolutely do not want to marry, sociopaths and the workless. Yeah, I agree with the workless. Yeah, this gets, it gets in it, like okay. in it, in it. I call this person workless because he doesn't work. <clears throat> Although he doesn't usually drink or use drugs exclusively, he is like an alcoholic in that he needs enablers, wives, family members, and friends to survive. And like an alcoholic, he usually finds them. The workless person seems to be able to work and may hold a job for a while, especially when he is young, but never for more than a few years. Maybe he gets fired, but sometimes he quits. Oh, mostly he gets fired, but sometimes he quits. By the time he's in his 40s, he is, it is unlikely that he will ever work again. He depends on others to take care of him. Tell me that that's not 90% of the emails that we get from women who have men that don't want to work. Yeah, that's it. They play video games. Mm -hmm. She supports them. They don't even really do much around the house to help them out. They don't do anything together outside of the house. Right. I believe that the workless person has a very low need for survival, significantly lower than the sociopath and a very high need for power, much like the sociopath. But he has none of the ganyas, the, desi the desire to work hard to survive that I talked about in chapter two. So he rarely, if ever, is able to satisfy his need for power. The low need for survival has left him with insufficient drive to do anything for himself, much less for others even for an employer who will pay him. The high need for power has inflated his opinion of himself to the unrealistic idea that almost anything he is asked to do is beneath him. Tell me that's not the emails that we get. That is. And the need for power <clears throat> explains the manipulation that comes from those men to those women. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I missed this the first time I read this book. Like everything in there is like, hey, dumbass, right. pay attention. You deal with this constantly. And I missed it. I don't know if maybe I, I was like talking or mm -hmm. if I was road hypnosis, but I, I missed four or five pages. You could have been focusing on a previous point that I was made. Could have been, but mm -hmm. I missed all of that. This is why I read books multiple times. This is why I go through and highlight shit. This is why you should listen to our podcast more than once. Yes. <laughs> that the un I, unrealistic idea that almost anything he has asked to do is beneath him is a very disgusting mentality to me. And that is majority of the women who email about their husbands being lazy. That is the mentality right. that they have. They can't find a job. The mm -hmm. jobs they find, they're not willing to do because it's beneath them. Right. The pay was too low. Yeah. He's a really good worker. He's had all these great jobs, but he hasn't worked in two years. I'm thinking about that email specifically. I think I can't remember which episode we covered it on. The gentleman lost his job. He was there for like 30 years and he mm -hmm. hasn't worked in five years. Yeah. And he keeps saying that he can't find a job of equal pay or more, and he's not willing right. to take anything beneath him. Right. He got to the point where he was willing to take anything. He just was now not able to find anything. Yeah. That's what he said anyways. That that email, I don't know. I don't know if, if he had the same job for 30 years. I don't know mm -hmm. if he would fall into this category. Um, do you remember the email that we got? Dude, we, we have done this a lot. We have, yeah. Holy shit. Because when you're like, this reminds me of that email. I thought of a totally different email than you did. Really? Do you remember the guy that couldn't hold a job? He had 10 jobs in two years. Yes. That's that guy. Yeah. He works for a couple of weeks and then quits or gets fired because it's beneath him or he doesn't want to do the job or he hates his employees or his employers or his coworkers. Like there's always a reason that he can't stay there anymore. And then he goes weeks or months without a job, gets a job to, to placate the woman, mm -hmm. keeps it for a week or two and then quits or gets fired and goes right back to playing video games, not helping around the house, not being a parent, right? just being a lazy fucking useless human being. Another one that triggers that thought is the 
boyfriend who had a job at the beginning and now he's driving her car around and is not doing anything at home while she's working. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We really do do this a lot. Mm-hmm. I think that's why it feels so redundant. Yeah. Because we, we, I mean, there's even, we've read probably 50 or 60 emails that never made it to podcast. Mm. So with yeah. all the ones that we've started and stopped. The high need for power. Oh, I just read that sentence. But it is the relationship between the two needs, a lot of power, but no drive to achieve it. That is the most critical part of his need profile. He talks and dreams big, but he performs small. Tell me that's not every man in every one of those emails. Yep. The workless person's need for freedom may be average or slightly above average. He does move around a lot, but I don't think it's so much for freedom as it's just for something to do. Because he's not willing to work. He likes to drift around, meet strangers, and talk about himself. The latter is characteristic. Mm Mm-hmm. He talks to you, never with you, about himself or people he knows. He is not interested in what you have to say. He has no real interest in anyone but himself. He also seems to have no insight into the fact that he is the way he is, especially that he doesn't work. Because he has such a high opinion of himself. Right. He thinks that he shouldn't have to take orders from anybody else. Right. That he talks to you, never with you. A reoccurring thing in all of the emails is he doesn't want to hear what I have to say or he Mm -hmm. shuts down. He wants to make his point and that's the end of it. Yep. Which is also a need for power. Yeah. When you look at it like that, it is. He wants to be the final say. These are all the men that want to be the man of the house, Mm. but don't know what it is to actually fucking be a man. So they want to be you without doing the work to be you. Mm. Nobody wants wants to do the work. It's hard. Nobody wants to do the hard shit. That's the difference between the people who actually do shit with their lives and don't. Mm. Look at all the people that are in Discord right now that are doing the work. Yeah. All the people on Patreon, all the emails that we get that are thank you emails that have nothing to do with anything other than a thank you. Mm-hmm. Hey, we did the check-ins. We had a nine-hour conversation. It was hard as a motherfucker, but we did it. And yeah. life is amazing now because of it. How long did it take you to actually have those conversations? It took somebody on the internet for you to recognize that it's a, there's a way to do it. You learn something and then you fixed your fucking shit and you could have been miserable for years Mm -hmm. and never said or done anything about it because you didn't know how it was too hard. You were too stressed out and frustrated to actually try to like look for something and you got lucky and found it on the internet. Like it just showed up on your feed. It's different when you seek things out and look for change versus when it falls in your lap. yeah. Yeah. The workless person does have the ability to receive love, an ability that is foreign to the sociopath. He likes to be loved and even more to be befriended. Unlike the sociopath, he has no problem making and keeping relationships. Because it benefits him. As long as nothing difficult, such as holding a job, is required of them. Right. When he is asked to do things that are normally done in a close relationship, like a marriage, he won't do his part. If you are marrying such a man, you are marrying a child who will never grow up. I've said that so many times over the last 24 episodes of these these podcasts. I feel like that's something that we've both just been saying. Yeah, over and over and over again. Yeah, yeah. we absolutely have. You can go on our TikTok. There's clips over and over and over of us going, you, you married a child. You have mm-hmm. a child. You got a, your fourth kid. Congratulations. It's your old man. Like He is so pleased and appreciative when you give him love and friendship that this show of appreciation will fool you and his parents into thinking that he can give some back but he can't, he has none to give. He does, however, have a very high need for fun in a childish sense. He tends to like school and makes up a significant proportion of the group called perennial students. Perennial students. Sometimes he finishes what he is studying, but mostly he doesn't. It is typical for him to get right to the end and then drop out. What he fears is finishing and having to go to work using what he has learned. If he goes to work, he does nothing. He acts, if it's, he acts as if he doesn't know what to do or what is expected of him. So he gets enough knowledge mm. to be educated in the conversations of the trade that, or the task that he's trying to, the field he's trying to get in. Right. So that he can talk himself up because he has the knowledge 
He just didn't get the degree to get a job. Mm. So when he sits down at a bar and has a discussion, he can talk to you, at you, as he said, at you, about him and about all of his accomplishments and how he's really good at what he does. And he's got these degrees, even though he doesn't actually have a degree because he can talk the game because he did all the work. But he stopped just short enough to actually get to the point where he can level up in life mm-hmm. because that would require him to actually get a fucking job. The workless person has little contact with the reality of the world. His reality is almost all of his own making. He seems normal as long as nothing is expected of him. He can act as if he's normal, but he's not. If you marry such a man, you may have a good companion as long as you support him, do almost all of the work, and don't ask anything of him. When you ask him to take a little bit of responsibility, he won't do it and continue and can get quite mean and abusive if you persist. Tell me that's not all those men. It is. When he does something, which at times he may, it is more for himself than for anyone else. Generally, if the workless get into top jobs through family influence, they do nothing, just sit there paralyzed while things fall apart around them or bark a lot of senseless orders that no one pays much attention to. Yep. The workless man tends to live in the past with the fantasy that before now, I was very competent and things were fine. He is perfectly willing to talk about his non-existent accomplishments and may talk about school where he may have done fairly well. If the workless person worked on a few days, he talks about it as if he'd worked for months. The past, as he remembers it, is always good. He always treats the future like a world of opportunity that is waiting for him. He doesn't want to do and doesn't do is live in the present, work, take responsibility, and get things done. He said he talks about a future that is waiting for him. Mm. He used the term is waiting for him. Not he's working for it or he's taking the steps and doing the things to reach that goal. Mm. So this person like really relishes his past and how amazing it was and talks about how great his future is going to be because he thinks the world is just going to fucking give him everything. Right. And, And he really believes that shit. That's crazy. These are the same people that are like, well, one day when I'm rich. How are you going to get there, buddy? By playing Xbox. For him, life is always back then or soon to be. It is never now. The workless often marry and have children. So if this condition is in their genes, it can be passed on. They say they love their children, but they do not love children enough to do much, if anything, for their own. When their children are young, they enjoy playing childish games with them. When their children are teenagers, these children may see their fathers more accurately than anyone else. Mm -hmm. At this point, many children lose interest in their workless fathers, and their fathers seem to lose interest in them. The fact that the children of the workless lose interest in them is a positive for the children. Otherwise, they would be disappointed. Do you know how many kids see their dads? And, and like in this scenario, mm-hmm. see their dad sitting at home, not doing shit while mom is stressed the fuck out, overworked, working crazy hours, cooking dinner, doing laundry, cleaning the house. Mm-hmm. And dad's doing nothing, watching TV, hanging out with his buddies, playing video games, not being present. Right. Kids see that young oh, yeah. men especially look to their fathers as a role model of what I'm supposed to do when I grow up. You are supposed to be leading by example. Mm-hmm. This is the leaning leading part of what we talk about all the time. If you can't do that, your kids are going to recognize that those young men are going to go, dude, what a piece of shit. Yeah. My dad doesn't fucking love me or my mom. He doesn't do anything other than sit around the house while my mom is fucking killing herself. That breeds bitterness and animosity. Those are the same kids that grow up to try to fight their dad because dad will get out of line when they're like 15, 16, 17 years old. Young men are going to be like, bro, who the fuck do you think you're talking to? You've disrespected my mother your entire life, my mm-hmm. entire life. And, and it creates a whole lot of conflict. Right. That's a very ugly thing for people that stay married for a long time that have kids. Almost all of us have known some workless men and we want to help them. They are frequently sent to psychiatrists. I've seen a lot of them, but few are amendable to psychotherapy because the goal of therapy is to help people to develop their better, to develop better relationships, which they can use to live more effective lives. When the workless start therapy, they often fool their counselors because they are often charming, relate easily, and give the appearance that with a little help, they can straighten themselves out. 
but this is the point. They just seem to want help. The workless love therapy. Instead of acting as clients and trying to get some help, they quickly become counselors, always talking, suggesting, and helping out. In a sense, what they try to do is to go into business with their counselors. If their counselors realize this is going on and become confrontational, the workless get angry, blame the counselors, and break off the relationships. In therapy, they act the same way as they do everywhere else. As long as nothing is asked of them, they are fine. But they are fine only for themselves, not for anyone else. In their efforts to deal with the hand their genes have dealt them, they may choose the up and down behavior that goes by the common diagnosis of bipolar disorder or manic depressive disorder. Tell me that doesn't sound like every fucking one of those emails that we got. I don't know how I missed this chapter. I'm glad you listened to it a second Dude, time. Dude, me too. Because we are we just did the first apology language, so it would be another four weeks mm-hmm. before I started on this book. Yep. By the time you guys hear this, we will only have one apology language left. Mm-hmm. And these, the, this entire book breakdown will be happening on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. on YouTube, uh, Eastern Standard Time. Correct. So if you guys are on uh, Spotify or whatever your, your streaming service is for the podcast, please, please, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. You are missing live streams and a ton of other content that we don't upload to the, the podcast. Mm-hmm. YouTube to be better. And while I'm plugging it, fuck it. If you guys are watching on YouTube, hit that like button. Thumbs up, notification bell, all that shit. You've heard us say it a thousand times. so And you've heard other YouTubers say it. So you know the routine. I'm only reminding you in case you haven't done it yet. Do your job. Don't be a workless. <laughs> I tried to be like... <laughs> I feel like I need to stop what I'm doing and go like something on our channel now. Yeah. <laughs> like, damn, okay. <laughs> But whether they are up, down, or in between, the workless are never competent. This is what makes them different from other bipolar people who are quite competent when they are not choosing to go too far up or down. Did you hear that word? Choosing. When bipolar are not choosing to go too far up or down. Mm -hmm. You guys, if you have any type of mental health issues or you've ever seen a therapist, you fucking need to buy this book. It has changed my entire outlook on my mental illness. Mm -hmm. And it's changed the way that I've dealt with all of it. I'm fucking dressed today. Yeah. Shaved my head this morning, showered this morning, did all the things that I didn't want to do because I knew my mental health was slipping. I made choices to feel better and feel fucking great. Yeah. I even took a nap. I took a nap today. You did. You laid on me. It was mm-hmm. great. Yeah. I left my phone in the room, so I just sat there in my thoughts while you slept. Snoring. No, you didn't really snore much. No, just no. the weird breathing thing that I do? A little bit. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but when I lay like that, I go... Pfft. Yeah, when I breathe. it's like your, your lips get <laughs> sticky. <laughs> It's probably all the energy drinks I drink. (laughs) That's so funny. Unlike bipolars, who are sometimes helped by lithium carbonate, I don't think lithium or any medication will help the workless. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be tried. Right. This guy actually is very against prescribing drugs. Right. He said it really like heavily in the Mm -hmm. beginning of the book. He doesn't prescribe medicine. Yeah. The workless choose bipolar behaviors because this up and down activity reflects their struggle with reality. Driven by their huge need for power, when they are on the high or the upper part of the bipolar cycle, they put pictures of themselves on very powerful, almost omnipotent persons in their quality worlds and go around acting as if they are such persons. Hey, we had a guy in Discord do that, remember? Yes. Holy shit. Talk about realizations. AJ, check that out. Oh, my God. (laughs) Wow. It all makes sense. Right? Holy shit. Wow. He was a workless. Yep. That explains so fucking much, dude. Wow. Yep. They have no desire to see themselves as they really are. As high as they are, with all the energy the high releases, they cannot do anything of value. They are like cars burning a lot of fuel to keep the motors racing, but they seem unable to stay in gear. For them, the only gear is neutral. I cannot imagine living my life like that. I couldn't either. 
Jesus Christ. I have a really hard time with people that don't have ambition. Oh, me too. And 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 I I normally can sniff these people out because mm-hmm. the people that talk all the time about all the great shit they're doing, you see that they don't have nothing. Right. And you can see that they're moochers. Like, I, I you need to show me. Like, mm-hmm. show me. Shut shut up. I want to see that shit. Oh, you're gonna open a business one day? Cool. It's been four years since you've been spouting that. Right. Doesn't take four years to open a business, bro. What are you waiting for? Are you going to be a good dad? Show me that shit because I see the way you treat your woman and your kids. Mm -hmm. Been spouting that shit for a while now too. Yeah. Yeah. One of my most realistic fears is being categorized as this. There's no fucking way. Oh, thank you. There's no way. There's, you wouldn't be here. There's no, dude, if that, if you were half of that, you'd have been out the door so long ago. Uh, We don't play those games around here. You and I work our asses off. Like, thank you. mm. I needed that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't do well with that lazy shit. I used to be a very, very lazy person. Well, no, not really. I worked. My pregnancies were probably one of the lowest points in my life. And during both pregnancies, they were both very high risk. Right. So I couldn't do anything. So I think after about three months of being on bed rest and throwing up into a bowl, I just decided like I'm just this lazy piece of shit. That's all my life has ever been. So I think that depressive episode and that feeling is what I fear of. Right. Versus actually being this because I know I'm not that. Yeah, he he talks in that book too about how how hard it is to come out of that depressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, he calls it the depressing because it's active. It's an action. You're choosing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he talks about once you get into that state, it's so much easier to be the victim and just stay there than right. it is to actively start making changes. Um, he also talks about his therapy, the way that he does them. They're not, it's not designed to keep you coming back long term. Mm-hmm. His business is not built off that. His business is built literally to teach people choice therapy and send them back into the fucking world because once you understand that, you can conquer anything. Hell yeah. Fucking love that book. I'm going to end up buying my own hard copy of that so that I can highlight shit. Yeah. It's going to be a study book. Do you think, I know you're looking for where you were. Do you think that we relate to things like this as because our perception is the same as his? Yes. And that's why I'm so into this book, because if I was reading another book by another doctor that said the opposite, I'd be like, what is this fucking garbage? Yeah, I agree. OK, so it, it is. Uh, I'm I'm relating to this because I already have those views and I'm holding mm-hmm. on to it because he's somebody of stat. OK, yeah, that makes sense. I just because I already believed all this shit. Right. I just now have a doctor who believes in it, too, that's changing lives like we are. But mm-hmm. he's doing it with letters behind his name. Like, right. Yeah, <clears throat> I've never heard of choice theory. I've been implementing this, though. Yeah, we both have for a while. So it's crazy to have a whole fucking theory withstanding behind something that we've just been fucking around with trying to figure out. Yeah, That therapist that sent us this book said that this is a very huge thing in in the Mm -hmm. therapy circles right now and that we are preaching what they have been trying to get across to people and we're doing it super blunt and like matter of fact. She was very impressed by what we were doing. That's why she recommended the books. Do you think the reason that we are so blunt and matter of fact is because we are not. How can I say this? So when you're a licensed therapist. You are being paid to be soft and gentle and understanding. You can't have a real discussion with somebody because they're not going to be able to handle those feelings in front of you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. he, He talks about that a little bit, too. I think you're right. Yeah. Go ahead. We both we both had a thought. I stopped yeah. mine, so you can have I don't yours. Remember. Um, I, I do think that they do that because they are trying to be professional mm-hmm. and try to make sure that they're not pushing people. Because like, some of the people that go to therapists are really fucked up and like need a whole lot of help. Do you think they could lose their license over something like that? I don't know. Like, I don't know if they had too many complaints of they're harsh or whatever. Do you think that if there were enough complaints about a psychologist or a therapist? being too blunt or not sugarcoating things or not doing kitty gloves. I would have before said no way. Yeah. But after seeing what's going on with Jordan oh, yeah. B. Peterson and the way they're trying to strip his license because of his his political views, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't have faith in that whole fucking yeah. any of that anymore. Um, I also would like to point out that the reason that we're as blunt as we are is not because we are not invested in these people. This is just who I am. It doesn't matter. It, huh? You look like you're about to say something. I don't. I don't understand why you're saying that. It's not that we're not invested. I don't. It, because you asked me if um, you said, D- 
do you think that oh wait maybe i miss maybe i just misheard that then because you said that do you think that therapists can't be as blunt as we are and i thought maybe that's where you were going is because we are able to do that because we're not invested in people no i hadn't okay so that wasn't your thought process no okay that was a me thought process then okay so you said that and it made my brain go we are able to do this because we are not therapists and we're not being paid to do these things so we can have these conversations and be blunt with people Mm -hmm. that happened that was my thought okay so i obviously thought past what you were saying into my own thought process and like Mm -hmm. um but I think that we are as blunt as we are because when it comes down to it, I'm tired of people playing the the, the victim card. Yeah, I'm over it. And the stress card. Like, I, I don't want, I don't, I'm not, that's mm-hmm. pathetic to me. I, I just don't, I'm so tired of that shit. We are fucking failing as a society because of that shit. We are. And I've just had enough of it. So, it, you know, I'm going to fucking piss people off. They have no desire to see themselves as they really are. As high as they are with all of the energy, the high releases, they cannot do anything of value. I just read all of yeah. that. You ended with the car sitting in neutral. Okay. Eventually. Eventually. Say that one again. Eventually. Okay. Eventually. Eventually. Fuck. <laughs> eventually. Reality. Other people's. Not their own. Begins to impinge on their activities. Impinge. Because they're not willing to do anything and everyone else around them is still grinding. You can only ride someone's coattails for so long. Mm-hmm. Curtails, I think, is actually the right way to say that. I think coattails. I think it's curtails. Curtails? I think so. Now I gotta look. I'm almost positive I've been saying that wrong my whole life. That also brings in... So there was an email we received where a woman was doing amazing in her career. And her man was getting a little salty about it and was pissed off that she's achieving her dreams and he's not. That's what I got from that. That reality, other people's not their own, is going to start to hit them in the face and they're going to recognize that they're falling behind. Right. Because you don't have the discipline and the stamina and the mental fortitude to actually get out there and get your shit. You're waiting for it to be handed to you and that's not how life works. So when you start to fall behind, you get angry about it. Yeah, and you see all those people leveling up. So in this scenario, you got a, a workless person in a house where a woman's thriving. Mm-hmm. She's going to really start to resent him. Oh, yeah. And like there would be open animosity and hatred because he's not doing what he needs to be doing while she's being coming successful and thriving. Uh, the word was actually coattails, not curtails. I don't know where that came from. It, it auto-corrected in one of our, our live streams yeah. or um, subtitles. So I, I thought that that's what it was. It wasn't. Um, but those men that that are, are workless or the women who are workless are not going to get mad about the other person leveling up because they continue to ride those coattails. So mm-hmm. as the other person levels, so do they. Right. They run out of money and place. They run out of money and a place to live. Wives, families, and friends stop helping them. They run out of gas and the engine turns off. Now they start to depress seriously. What they are depressing about is the fact that they live in a cruel world where no one sees them willing to recognize their talents or where no one seems to be willing to recognize their talents enough to stay with them. So then they become the victim. Yes. And blame the world. Yes. They never think of how little they give and delude themselves into not seeing that they are mainly takers. They depress not because of all the lives they have damaged, they never see it that way. Their depressing is kind of resetting. Oh, the de- their depressing is kind of resting and forgetting phase. After a while, they start up their motors again, and the process repeats. Up and down, but always standing still. When they are low, they may be suicidal, but not as suicidal as competent people who are better able to recognize reality. Those are the same people who are like, the world is against me. Everyone right. sucks. And then they come back off that low, mm-hmm. like a bipolar episode and, and come back up a little bit and then start fighting. All, all they need to come out of that is to find one person that's willing to let them sk- like ride their coattails yeah. and mooch off of them to be right back up to where they were. If they run out of money and need care, their families or whoever else cares for them should offer them a structured home setting in which they have to prepare their food if they want to eat. It should also be an environment in which they can just sit if they don't work. They should not be locked in. They should be free to come and go, but given only enough money for the food they have to buy and prepare. 
There should be no passive entertainment, such as radio or television, except in a special room that they can gain access to only by working. Active entertainment, like basketball, should be available if they can find someone to play with. Activity is good for them. They are generally inactive. Tell me that's not every man in those emails. It really is, though. I feel like I'm reading a medical journal that was done on a a study of a hundred human males and their families in a dome somewhere in the desert. <laughs> is that's how it reads? It, like, dude, that I that you know how many times we've told people like cut your internet off. Seriously, yeah. He, Treat he, them he, like a child. He fucking said that. Let them sit in a room by themselves all day with no entertainment mm-hmm. other than letting them leave to go outside and do physical activity or them coming and going as they please. Yeah. But you shouldn't be doing anything other than feeding them if they're willing to make their own food. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't even go that far. No. I, I mean, I'm not, fuck, I'm not feeding you. Why? Because where you have DNA that's shared? Mm. No. No. You, you do something to bring provision to this household. Yeah. I also want to point out to everybody that's watching this right now, This he specifically said that it is more common, uh, I'm sorry, it is less common for women to fall into this category because it is more acceptable for women to be taken care of by a man than it is for a man to be taken care of by, by a woman. Mm-hmm. So there are stay-at-home wives who don't fucking do shit, but sit oh, at yeah. home and play video games and ignore the kids, don't cook, don't clean, do all that shit. So men... Don't think that we're shitting on you in this scenario. It does happen with women too, but the book is specifically talking about men because our statute, we are supposed to provide and lead. Yeah. Women, you don't get off the fucking hook. You're part of the problem in this too. Yeah, no, we had an email of a military man who wrote in saying that his girlfriend is a streamer. Yeah. Staying up until two or four o'clock in the morning, knowing that he needs to be up by 4 a.m. I remember that email. And she's not having any income into the household. She's eating all of his food. Mm -hmm. And she stays up late to not have to go to bed with him right. so that she can play video games with her friends overseas. Mm-hmm. And her streaming brings in less than $100 a month. You're not a streamer at that point. Like, you can make more money selling pictures of your feet. Yeah, you really could. I'm disgusted by humanity. I'm disgusted that we allow this shit to happen. Because we do. Yeah, that falls into the humanity aspect. Yeah. The staff should not talk with them unless they do something tangible for the house that is. This motherfucker just called their family the staff. Mm. And the staff member's judgment worth talking about. He just called their family the staff. Yeah. That's how you have to treat people like that. Mm-hmm. He also said that the staff, that person can come to them and say something. And if they deem it not worthy or provisional to the household... They're not going to engage. That's insane. Could Mm. you imagine limiting contact to, did you get a job today? No? All right, dope. Fuck off. I got nothing else to say to you. I mean, that's that's how it would work for me. Yeah. I don't care how the weather is. I don't care that your favorite team just won. Yep. I don't care what the fuck just happened in your video game. I have described sociopaths in the work list as if they were pure cases. Sociopaths are close to pure cases. They don't vary much except that some are killers and some are not. What makes one a killer and the other, I do not know. Oh, what makes one a killer and the other not, I do not know. I suspect that the killer has the worst possible or non-existent relationships, but that is a guess. If I was involved with one of them, I would always suspect the worst. The work lists come in many shades of gray. Some of the high-grade work lists can hold special jobs in which no- nothing much is asked of them, and they don't even have to be present all the time. So that dude who had his job for 30 years and then lost it and hasn't worked in the last five years, that could have been that. Could have been. Yeah. Because yeah. he had a job. It could be also why he lost his fucking job. Yeah. He was doing just enough to scrape by without being looked at, and when they scrutinized his workload, they were like, yeah, we mm-hmm. don't need him. Very well could be. Yeah. Some work for themselves doing odd jobs, but never steady and never if there is any hard work to do. If they have jobs, when they go into their high phase, they will walk off them because they view themselves as overqualified for whatever they are supposed to do. Yep. But I can't think of any workless men of any shade of gray whom you would want to marry. 
But if you are married to one of the high-grade workless and he treats you well, you may be able to stay with him. That is the real difference between the high-grade and the usual workless. The high-grade workless man treats the wife who takes care of him well. It's like being married to an adult child. He won't change, but he may not get worse. If I were married to one, I would make it clear that this trip through life with me will last only as long as he treats me well. Patron. Patron. We've gotten three of them since the last one. Holy I've been shit. I've been holding them back. What I was going to say earlier, and you're like, I got a thought, and, and like we both lost our thoughts, is that I want to start saying their names. Do you think that would be wrong if we were saying like, whose got a patron, their name is Jessica. Like, do you think that that would be inappropriate? I don't think we do that. Okay. I thought yeah. it was a cool idea, but I've thought about that too. But I don't want to put people's information out there. You're not wrong. Well, I mean, if it's just a first name, it could literally be anyone. No, I guess maybe not. Yes, you're probably right. You're probably right. I have described these types of people partly so you may realize that the strengths of the needs lead to some unusual people, people you need to be aware of. But only a few people <clears throat> have need profiles that push them to become sociopaths. Although the workless are much more common. The vast majority of us have genes whose strength lie well within three deviations from the norm, a wide range, but still considered statistically normal. Most of us can relate quality worlds that work in the real world and are strong. Oh, fuck. Most of us can create quality worlds that work in the real world and are strong enough to create an effective life with good relationships. Does that build off of the cognitive bias that we create through our experiences in life that we project onto our perspective? And that's what he means, that we are creating our own world within the world of reality? Yes, I think so. I, I actually think so. That cognitive bias that that Chris Voss talked about and never mm -hmm. split the difference changed my thought process on a lot of things. That's where my perception versus reality comes in a lot because mm -hmm. our worlds are very different. You see things differently than I do. Um, it's why everybody has such a different personality and it's right. why two people can be growing up in the same house. Twins mm -hmm. can grow up in the same house and one will be a piece of shit and one will be super successful because they don't want to be what they saw growing up. Right. It is a, it is cognitive bias. It's your perception. That's crazy. I, I'm almost positive that was everything in that, that, that part of it that we needed to read. Um, I mean, you can keep going if you really wanted to, but I, that I, I can't believe that we have been doing this and have been having these discussions and talking about these things the way that we have for so long. And it is an actual thing. It is. All right. Before we get in emails, mm. we need to, we you need didn't close the door. Oh, bitch. It's open. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm Has not, the dryer gone off yet? I have no idea. It doesn't sound like it's running. Yeah, it's off. So, okay. um, and I know the dishwasher is not running because I didn't hear that either. So the door is just going to be open. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't fuck up our lighting too much. Um, so before we get into emails, I know that we need to come up with a term for workless so that we don't just continue to bite his thing. Okay. So for everyone who's watching this on YouTube, in the comment section, not in the live chat, in the comment section, tell us what we should call these people. And it can't be things like lazy. Like we actually need a phrase that we can coin for to be better that describes that. So when people are like, what is that? And be like, I, I can then tell them to go read that book. That is our, our version of that because we were talking about it before we read the book. We need a, we need our, our own thing. So we need the to be better nation to actually come together and give us some, some feedback there. Oh, I'm really gonna have to put thought into this. Yep. Okay. So I wanted to get into this while you're reading the book, but I didn't want to interrupt what we were talking about because I wanted to really get that point across. But while we were doing that, we got three patrons. Four patrons, something like that. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to quickly plug, plug the Patreon, and then we're going to move on to the email reading. For those of you who don't know, we have a Patreon community that gets exclusive content, um, early release content, as well as uh, Q&A live streams that we do on Sunday nights. It gets access to our Discord channel, which has a it's a private Discord channel. So the only way that you can get into it is if you're a VIP tier on Patreon. And we are using that platform to build a very dope community of people. Um, we talk about everything on there from homesteading to religion to uh, relationship problems to depression to stupid shit photography. Like it is a very broad community over there. Mm -hmm. Chats for everything. The server's super dope. 
I highly recommend that you check that out. Uh, if you don't want to do the Patreon thing, that's fine too. Super chats go a long way for us, but the best thing that you could do to help us grow the channel, if you enjoy what we are doing, is to share this content. Give it to people that you like. Give it to people that you don't like it. Share it with your grandma. She's not going to like the F words, but she may be like, damn, the young people are right. Sorry, grandma. I'm not. I got a comment on one of my videos on TikTok. Mm. I want to say the guy's name was like Michael something. And he's like, I really love the message that you, you're putting out, but your cursing really turns some of your, your viewers off. And I'm like, that's okay, because it, it brings a lot of others in. Yeah. And I was like, if I have to be the way that I am for people to hear the message that we're, we're getting out, who otherwise would not be reached, it's going to be like that. Yep. And he's like, I, I get it. You can't please everyone. Mm-hmm. And like unfollowed me. And that's cool. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there saying the same things we're saying who don't cuss. Right. Go and, follow them. Yeah. And they're, they're right. Right. But the people who are following us, I mean, look at the amount of people that are doing exactly what we do and and look at their following Mm -hmm. compared to what we're doing. A lot of people vibe with the way that we talk because it's authentic. Yeah. They want that. People want that real shit. I think that by the end of the day, we are going to be sold out of shirts. I would love that. Me too. Because I will. Amazing. um, Hey. (laughs) Hey. You look really good over there. Thank you. That's not what I was going for, but damn woman. Yeah. I saw the little curls and they, they were going down, which made my eyes go down. And then I saw the straps, which made my eyes go down some more. Yeah. I'm at two, two things because I, I actually have a story now <laughs> yeah. and it's going to be relevant. I'll get back to the story. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> fuck, dude. <clears throat> I was going to say <laughs> <laughs> that we should redo the Egos Kills Talent shirts in a different color other than red. And I'm thinking maybe blue or purple. Somebody in, in Discord suggested purple, but maybe even a hot pink. I would wear a hot pink. Okay. When I own the comic book store, mm. this is the story. Okay. Um, there was a kid that came in there all the time. Somebody that's relevant in our community and like mm. the nerd community. And he was one of those kids that would just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and didn't understand understand social cues mm-hmm. when it's time to stop speaking. So I would just walk away while he was talking. He'd be, I, I've seen that. I do it all the time. Yep. I don't give a shit. If you don't understand the social cue that it's time for you to stop talking, I'm going to walk away. Yeah. And if you're offended by that, do something about it. Mm-hmm. I don't care. Well, I did that to him while he was super excited one day and he went... <gasps> in front of everyone in the comic book store and i didn't hear it because i walked out the door like i fucking left while he was mid-sentence i got in my car and i left and i came back in and everyone started laughing i'm like why are you guys laughing you're like you didn't hear what happened i'm like no and they explained it to me and every for like i don't know a week every time something bad happened everybody go (laughs) and that's what my brain did when i saw you sitting over there i was trying to talk to you i was like (laughs) (laughs) and that's why i had to talk to you like this because that's all that was happening in my brain yeah so stupid i like how you just bask in me i can't help it i can't even look at you right now (laughs) do that shit on purpose i'm walking around like a fucking distraction what do i do on purpose daddy oh come on it's in my ears. You you really want to play that game? I'm feeling a little feisty after yesterday, yeah. We have emails to read. Fuck! <laughs> <laughs> and I have to order lunch still. <laughs> God, I wish I could leave that in there. Oh, that was so good. That was good. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I, there's got to be a way for me to cut that. To leave, <laughs> leave, leave that. We have to do emails and you go. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, fuck. I love you. I love you, too. Like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I've worked up an appetite when you order lunch. Let me know where you're getting it from. (laughs) Okay. So this one's called Thank You. You're welcome. What can I say except you're You're welcome? welcome. (laughs) 
What is it? For the sun, the moon, the uh, sky? Oh, who knows? I just want to thank you both for your podcast. I ran across your TikToks a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago. And have been nonstop watching your YouTube videos. Your videos came up. I can't do this. I. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you try to play a game. Fuck around and found out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. I'm sweaty while simultaneously cold as fuck. <laughs> like, you are really going through it over oh there. Oh my god, <laughs> the back of my neck is tingling. That's funny. I just wanted to thank you both for your podcast. I ran across your TikToks a couple of weeks ago, and I've been nonstop watching your YouTube videos. Your videos came in just the right time because my husband and I were in the middle of a fight and we were not talking to each other and it went on for like that. I went on like that for a couple of days. They didn't speak to each other for a couple of days. You look like you're in the middle of something, so I'll wait. Um, that was my daughter. Mm. They didn't talk to them, each other for a couple of days. Could you imagine that? And how uncomfortable that household would be and how that would feel waking up, walking past your person and intentionally giving them silent treatment to show them how hurt you are to make them feel the way that you're feeling versus trying to resolve the problem. Well, I think he's a trucker because she ends the email with he is away from home so often. Okay. So he could have been on the road. I I, I skimmed over the email. It's something that we can definitely talk okay. about, but I don't think she specifies what he does. <clears throat> okay. So I couldn't imagine you've been gone for three days, we get into an argument. I don't hear from you for three or four days after that. And you're already not home. That is just total disconnect. Yep. Yeah. My husband and I have been married for one year, but I've been together for five years. He is going to be 30 in July, and I just turned 28 in April. I have a 10-year-old son who was five when my husband and I started dating. We now have a daughter together who is a year old. So so you guys have been married for one year and you have a one-year-old? They've been together for five, though. Right. So that first year of marriage, that's when a lot of things start to change. I don't know what it is about getting married, but people, after the marriage is done, the mindset changes. That's because people think they own you at that point. That really does come to that ownership thing we yeah. talked about. So not only are you now navigating the... It's not an upgrade, like a level up to being a husband and a wife. You now have a newborn, which is added stress on top of everything that you're now having to navigate. Yeah. Okay. Off topic. Have you ever seen the movie White Squall? No. Okay. It needs to go on the list. My husband became an over-the-road truck driver after we had our daughter so that I was able to become a stay-at-home mom. Good for him. Yeah. He did what needed to be done. My husband is gone for a few months at a time, but we always call each other every day and he video chats with the kids and has always helped me when I call him needing help with my son's homework or even just keeping the baby smiling over the phone when he can tell I've had enough. That's rough. That's rough. He's gone for months at a time, she yeah. said. That's rough. I could not <clears throat> imagine being either side of that scenario, being the wife at home, stay at home wife, stay at home mom. Having to get the uh, son to school, probably taking care of the one year old, handling everything at home while the husband's away for months. And the husband's away for months only seeing his newborn daughter or the, the one year old. He's on, missing yeah, milestones on FaceTime. Yep. On FaceTime. <clears throat> yep. There's sacrifices being made on both sides of that. And I'm, I'm wondering if they realize that with each other. Right. Because your perception is your reality, not yeah. your partner's. So, she views things one way, he views it another, and I wonder where if there's a disconnect. Yeah, there could be. Because there's a lot of men who are highly successful that missed out on a lot. We, mm -hmm. we I get the comments in my TikToks constantly. We're, we're blue-collar men who are like, you think we fucking enjoy working 80 hours a week and missing out on our kids' lives? Like, It's what has to be done. Yep. My husband and I have always strived to live as a traditional marriage, or how you guys have put it, as we have trad traditional gender roles. Or how you guys have put it as we have traditional gender roles. How is that different? It's not. We call it traditional values. People call it traditional gender roles. 
It's the same thing. But she said how, or how you guys have put it, we have. Maybe we've called it gender roles. I'm so confused. I don't know. It's all the same thing. Yep. Okay. We have never had a name for it or actually discussed it, but it's just how we both were raised. Your podcast helped us communicate and has helped me articulate what I have been feeling and helped me put my thoughts into words. I have never been good with words, and every time I have tried to talk and get a feeling across, I would get overwhelmed with emotions and would end up crying or yelling. With my past, I have always suffered with PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Ever since I have been with my husband, he has helped me through so much and has taken the time to understand. My husband has always been a very hardworking man and has continued to keep striving for better. He has brought us a living... He has brought us from living on the ghetto side of Tucson in a two-bedroom rundown home to now living in a spacious three-bedroom home in a small family-oriented community. Love that. Talk about a fucking upgrade. Yeah. Yeah, old boy's doing the work. Oh, yeah. And he, and he was living like that. Mm-hmm. To, to be clear, he was, he was living like that also, which means he met a woman, got married, and decided that it was time to fucking do more. We talk about this so much. Yeah. When you get a good man who loves you, he's going to go above and beyond to make your fucking life better. Mm -hmm. This is the provision. And he's making huge sacrifices in his personal life to make sure that they have that comfort. He really, really is. He was what I used to call a grumpy old man who was always stressed and afraid to have fun. And I thought he was always trying to shoot down my dreams. Our fights used to end in a huge blowout with both of us screaming and he would end up leaving the house. We have grown from that to now our fights being very rare and we have been working on communication. I love that. Not only is your relationship improving, you're setting a standard for that 10 year old boy. Mm -hmm. And now a one year old girl. Yep. I wonder at what point they're going to stop calling them fights. Because your verbiage matters. It does. And you calling it a fight makes it sound like you guys are really fucking going through it. Right. When I hear we had a fight, I'm picturing like MMA shit. Yeah. Well, you know, this is an us thing. I used to say we would argue. Mm -hmm. And you'd be like, we're not really arguing. I'm like, no, babe, we're having a a disagreement. It's technically by definition an argument. I was like, it's not to the level that you hear argument when you, when I say argument. So I stopped calling them that. Mm -hmm. And then I had to find a word that worked and it went to tiffs and we would call them spats and tiffs because they weren't really arguments. They were just elevated conversation. Mm -hmm. And now we've landed on disruptions because I view it as we had hit a static channel for a minute while we're flipping through channels to get where we're going. And it's just a minor disruption of our day because otherwise we would have made it from point A to point B with no issues. We had to stop and get gas as a disruption. Yeah. So we're getting gas. It's like turbulence on a plane. Yeah. Yeah, we call arguments getting gas from now on. I stopped at the gas station. Got to refuel. Yeah. Figure out what's going on. Maybe you got to pee. Something's not Get quite some right snacks. on the trip. Got to clean the window a little bit so we can see what's going on. Yeah. A good little metaphor. I like that. <clears throat> Even in the metaphor, you're making sure my car is taken care yes, of. Yes, ma'am. And that you're safe. <sighs> Fuck. <laughs> What are you giggling for? Even in hypothetical situations, you're hot. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, I'm lucky as fuck. (laughs) Since watching your videos, I have now been able to understand what my husband is feeling and how certain things affect him as a man and seeing more than my side. The other day, we had a long hour discussion on what we expected from each other and being in a traditional marriage and what certain things trigger us to the heightened emotion where we feel we need to defend ourselves. About two days ago, I was going to email you both about how my husband is being so stubborn and mad all the time to now emailing you saying, thank you for teaching me how to speak and communicate to my husband in a way that didn't set off any triggers for him and also let my husband know the certain things he says to me, I realize triggers me. Even though he's not able to be around, I still want to show him that he's the king of his kingdoms. Love that. Me too. We still have so much more than we need to discuss in terms of check-ins and how we want to implement the check-in, not just with us, but our kids. I feel so much joy in talking to him about the things and less weight trying to think about what I'm going to say that won't get him upset. We haven't had a conversation like that where I felt both us learning. We haven't had a conversation like that where I felt us both learning from each other 
and I was able to open his eyes to a few things that he does that makes me do certain things in return without it ending in him feeling defensive or that I'm not appreciative. Okay, so let's pause for a minute because he doesn't make you do shit. He says something, you hear it, Mm -hmm. and you react. You are making a decision to do the things that you're doing. Correct. And when you realize that that's what's happening, you now have a decision to act differently. Mm -hmm. He has the same ability. So don't ever try to throw shade on the other person and be like, they made me do this, or they said this, and it made me do that. That's a victim mentality. You're not taking accountability for your action in the moment. Your responses, are they matter. They They are a decision. So now that you know your triggers, your triggers are your responsibilities. They're Mm -hmm. no one else's. You can't expect other people to cater to your issues. That's a you problem. So he should, as your husband, care enough to not want to trigger you but you need to work on your triggers also and understand that's a you problem. Yeah. I like to say that I am a woman full of purpose and thought and not just an animal reacting to my surroundings. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. <clears throat> so I guess I would like to thank you so much, but also ask what advice would you give us in terms of how we can keep the intimacy with him being away from home so often? You guys should have a ton of intimacy when he's home. I mean, wouldn't, right, wouldn't you so. think that you would miss each other and like want to talk on the phone and, and do that? Like, okay, so I'm going to reread that. Okay, did I not understand what they were asking? I think you took it differently. Okay, how can we keep the intimacy with him being away from home so often? So if he's away from home for a few months, how do they keep the intimacy alive when he's not home? Oh, I have no idea. I don't do long long distance relationships. Yeah. I got to be honest, in that scenario, they just need to talk on the phone every day and like remind him that he's working, like show your gratitude. I fucking appreciate everything that you're doing. Like, yeah. I know that this is hard for you. Uh, you know, you're you're a great dad. Thank you for everything that you're doing. And then you need to really, really fucking lay it on him when he's home. Mm-hmm. Lots of physical contact, cooking, make them fucking meals, like take him his plate, do, do the thing, like make him feel like the king, as you put it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then hopefully in, in return, he reciprocates that and treats you like the queen that you are like that. I, I don't know. I, I really struggle with that long distance relationship. If I was an on the road trucker and that was my job and we had a little kid, I don't think that I'd be able to do that. Yeah. I really don't think I would. I, I don't know. It would be very difficult for me to leave you home with a baby and, and be gone like that. Yeah. I respect the shit out of those jobs. My dad's well, my stepdad, uh, my adopted dad, JJ is a truck driver. My brother, Brandon's a truck driver. My real father, my biological, actually has a CDL too. So, like, I have a lot of respect for those guys. But I know me as a person, I couldn't do long distance shit. I would yeah. want you with me in the truck. I would go with you in the truck with a baby. Yeah. We, that would make for a very difficult living situation. You do it for a year. I would find a way to get that truck to make it mine and open a business yeah. and pay somebody else to drive that fucking truck. That'd be smart. Yep. Uh, send pictures. Booty shots. Do the booty pics. You can literally Google how to do boudoir photos at home. And professional photographers will give you tips on how to set up your phone and pose yourself in your bedroom. You can actually do that on TikTok. Ew. The boudoir photographers are on TikTok showing people how to take selfies and boudoir photos. Oh, I like that as photographers. Okay, I thought that they were were saying that there's just random women telling you how to take ass photos on TikTok. No, no. I meant like actual boudoir photographers trying to show you how to... Like set your phone up and pose. So it's like a legit. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Because yeah. it's a it's a marketing tactic. Yeah. If you can do that, you can teach some woman how to like stand or pose and get a good photo for their husband, and they get super into it. They may book a, a thing because they're right. like, okay, well, she obviously knows her shit. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Do that. Um, send more photos throughout the day of what you and the kids are randomly doing. Make him feel. It'll, it will help him feel like he's more involved in the day-to-day goings of what you have going on. If you have a random thought, no matter what it is, something super ridiculous, something really funny, it could be something sweet, could be something you just heard on the news and you were like, oh shit, I'm going like down a rabbit hole, tell him. Yeah. I wonder, I, I, don't, I don't know if I could do that job. Yeah. Because it, like even in that... You would get to the point where you don't have conversations anymore. Mm. Like, okay, here's the here's the train of thought just so that everybody gets it because it happens like that in my head. If that was me and you were here and we had a child and I'm missing these things and it got to the point where I'm on the phone with you constantly on FaceTime, attached to the window, mm-hmm. and we're having these discussions, eventually you're going to have to put the phone down or we're going to have to switch to a regular 
non-handheld thing because otherwise I'm looking at the ceiling or it's killing my battery or there's no data, whatever. So we end up on the phone and then that becomes our kind of new normal because it's easier because I'm driving through weird areas and there's no signal, whatever. We're going to get to the point where we're sitting in silence and I'm driving and you're not really talking and I'm not really talking because we've had all the talks that need to be had where the baby's screaming and like I'm listening to all that bat in the background and I'm just kind of driving, doing mm-hmm. my thing. I would rather listen to a podcast or an audiobook than listen to us sit on the phone in silence. Mm-hmm. That would create a problem for me. I yeah. there's no, I couldn't do this. I don't I I know that there are people that are super successful in these kind of relationships. This would fucking wreck me as a person. Yeah. Yep. I'm glad you know yourself like that. I, well, yeah. I, I would I because I'm thinking about it. Like I, I gotta be honest, if I was driving, I get annoyed driving in shitty traffic anyways. Mm-hmm. But if I was driving a fucking huge truck and I'm having to be hyper aware of everything that's on the road and I'm on the phone or I'm listening to a podcast and my fucking phone is going berserk, it's not like I can text and drive. That's dangerous. You know what I mean? Like, so if you're sending me 900 messages a day, I'm going to feel like I'm neglecting my duty as your husband because I'm not there. I'm not being present in the text message. We have to talk on the phone. I, I don't know, man. I just don't get it. I don't understand how they do it. My brain won't. I can't wrap my head around it. Too much. It is. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. <clears throat> you ready for the next question? Oh, there's another one. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I can help. I, I I got nothing on that. Okay. How can I help my husband feel like he is upholding his man of the house role without giving him a honey to do list or feeling overwhelmed with things when he gets home? Um, a honey do list is not a problem. If he's gone for weeks at a time, your house needs maintenance. Mm-hmm. It's his job. I don't know how long he's home for. But if he comes home for a night and his entire night is spent fucking doing shit, then you guys need to rework the way things are done. He needs to hire somebody to come and, and take care of that list mm-hmm. um, or have like a lawn service so he doesn't have to worry about that shit. Um, I don't see nothing wrong with a honeydew list. Okay. I would rather have that list than not. You give me a list of chores. I, I can look at that list and go, okay, this is going to take two minutes. This is going to take 10 minutes. It's going to take an hour. And I can knock out all those minute shits and get them done. And then I can rest. Mm-hmm. And then I can get up and do the things and take me an hour. And then I can rest. And I can time management based off that list. I'd much rather have a list than, hey, what else did you need me to do? Right. Hey, what else did you need me to do? And I can cross the shit off the list. I'd be like, mm-hmm. I got one left. When I'm done with this, I can sit down and watch TV or I can go to yeah. bed. And you'd be like, hey, I got, no, I wasn't on my list. Yep. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> Add it to the next list. Yep. I like, I like lists. So you did the honeydew list. Yep. So that was one aspect of that question. I got hung up on it. Okay. How can I help my husband feel like he is upholding his man of the house role? You can't make him do anything. If he's doing that, he'll know it and he should feel good about it. If he's not, he'll know that he's not holding up his end of shit. Okay. Um... I, I think that that's not really what she's asking, but verbiage matters. I think when it comes down to it, you need to be appreciative and tell him that he's doing a good job. It comes down to gratitude. Okay. How can I teach my son the way to being a gentleman and learning the man of the house role? I do not believe his bio dad is teaching him these things. Well, why isn't the new dad teaching him things? You're married. He's a stepdad. Why isn't he doing it? He's away from the house for months at a time. Still have those life lessons. You can learn a lot going on a fishing trip. Yeah can learn a lot going on a, a day trip where they go and, and go to an aquarium and have real life conversations. Mm-hmm. But luckily for you, there is a video on our YouTube channel called The Gentleman. You can have him watch that. Yeah. Also, what advice can you give? What advice can you help me pass on to my husband to help him feel less stressed and help him feel more accomplished and proud of what he's doing? She's trying to do the work for him. You can't do that. You literally, it's, I'm not telling you that you can't because I don't think you can. You literally cannot right. make him feel like he is accomplishing what he needs to. Right. If he feels like a failure, he needs to sit back and really sit down and think about why, why feel- am I feeling this way? Yep. Because my family went from living in a piece of shit hole <clears throat> to now living in a upstanding neighborhood where I don't have to worry about what's happening. And right. I can I can be away and do this job to provide my wife has the privilege to be a stay-at-home mom because of what I'm doing. And it is a privilege. Yeah. It is a privilege that a lot of women wish they could have. Mm-hmm. You can't make somebody feel anything. The best thing that you can do is show him gratitude and be there for him and like be that support system and hope that it makes him realize that he's doing what needs to be done. 
be, because I got to be honest, there's a lot of men out there who want to be the leader of the house and be the man of the house, so to speak, that don't have the qualities of actually being a good man. And then wonders why their women is so combative and controlling and mothering and nagging. Mm-hmm. They know. They know. Deep down inside, they fucking know. They, they may want to act up and, and, and huff and puff and act like there's some hot shit. Men, you know who you are. You know what you're fucking about. You can, you can try to act all you want, but deep down, you know who you are. Anything else you want to add to that? Nope. I, I think that she just needs to focus gratitude. Mm-hmm. Always show gratitude. Appreciation. Yeah. I mean, we do that for each other. Mm-hmm. That goes a long fucking way. It doesn't make me feel like I'm working to just work. I don't feel like I'm obligated. I don't feel like I have to do this. I, I'm doing it because I'm appreciated. Mm-hmm. You'd be surprised at what people do when they realize that, that the people around them are grateful for what they're doing. It's not controlling. It's you're, not. you're allowing me to do things for you. How many do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I think we're probably an hour and a half in. Okay. Because we had that nonsense that happened. Okay. I'd like to get us at least past two hours of actual audio time. Okay. YouTube live and a question. Okay. Hi, Chris and Peaches. Congratulations on an amazing YouTube live. I love seeing so many people support you and the work you do. You're changing lives. Thank you for all you give. I know this is not in relation to the live last night. No. Not at all. This was sent over a month and a half ago. Reading that and knowing that last night's live was what it was, it makes me feel good. Yeah, last night's live was off the chain. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of fucking information on there. I I went in Discord and was like, hey, I think we should cut that and like post the after the apology language shit as a separate video. And everyone was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I asked a question regarding my husband seeing the gift of my submission as a burden. Oh, shit. Do you remember this? No, but what a fucking statement. I was so nervous sending in the question because this has been something I haven't shared with anyone. To see you both understand and acknowledge my pain and hurt meant more than you can imagine. It broke me seeing my feelings validated. Until your reaction, I could tell myself that I was overreacting. That I should be happy my husband provided well and loves me and our children. I mean, you should still feel that way. If this is just the one aspect of your relationship where it's not where you want it to be and everything else is great, you should still be appreciative and happy at the fact that your husband is doing good for you and doing right by your family. Right. I wish I could turn off the submissiveness submissiveness inside of me. I've prayed this need would go away. Why would you want to lose that submissiveness? Right. Real shit. Real shit, our relationship wouldn't be what it is if you were combative towards me. No, it wouldn't be. Our, the submissiveness in you and the the need to lead in me, and I'm not. I chose the word lead and not dominate because mm-hmm. it's not a domination thing. It it's is not. about leading and and being a provider and a protector. And and you you choosing to submit and allow me to do those things have made us very close, because I feel like I am protecting you and I am doing my duty as a man. And you you submitting. And doing the things that you're doing as a woman has allowed you to become more feminine. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you want to lose that? Nature dictates that this is the way it's supposed to be. It's a very beautiful thing when you think about it. Yeah. Our love and what we have is a very beautiful thing in this universe. Yeah. And it's very much built on trust. It is. If anything, it grows stronger. It's growing stronger because everybody has the things that they have requirements for in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Me being submissive is a requirement. Yeah, it actually is. We had that discussion in the beginning. If I can't be in a relationship with a man who is able to take the lead and be the man of the household and I'll, and like, um, I want to say like shelter my submissiveness. I don't know if that's the correct terminology, but it's almost just cherishing it like this is a very beautiful thing and if you drop it once you can probably shatter it and it will never be the same again yep and you do that i hold that in a high regard yeah um shelter it i guess kind of makes sense the way you described it protect it Mm -hmm. don't devalue it i don't know it's priceless how about that it's priceless because if it gets broken it's not going to ever be the same again Mm mm-hmm Like a Fabergé egg. It's okay to have those requirements in a relationship. Mm -hmm. If this was an issue, I can't remember if they have kids or not. They do. Children. 
if this was a problem before you have kids, you should have said something then. If your requirements, everybody has at least 10 requirements in a relationship where they're like, I am not going to back down from this stance. Yeah. This is a line I will not allow them to cross. This is something that I'm not willing to forego for the rest of my life. And if somebody doesn't want to meet those, it's okay. You can say, you know, it's just not working out. I think you're a super dope person. I just don't think our energies are for each other. Right. That's okay to say. You know what I want to do? Hmm. I want to fill that entire bookcase with camera equipment. Okay. I think that would make such a dope Instagram photo. I'm here for it. Take every, like, obviously we need to buy more, more shit to make right. it actually fit, but like space everything with a fucking ruler mm -hmm. so that everything is perfectly symmetrical. I'm even willing to bet that 200 to 600 millimeter Sony F four uh, G master we have will fit where that 70 to 200 is. And we can set them up in height. Yeah. Not by millimeter. But by like little lens to big lens, so mm -hmm. that they stack. I bet I think about that every time I sit down. I've just never actually said anything, and I, it's all I see in my head when I look at that bookcase. I had that thing custom built to stick in the window, and it's literally a catch-all. I think camera equipment would look really good right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Can I use the very bottom row for plants? I mean, after I get that picture, you can do whatever you want with it. I'm not going to leave the shit there. I just want to take a picture of it. Oh, I, I yeah, we use all this shit too much for me to take it down okay. and put it back up every time. I just want the photo because it would look really fucking dope mm -hmm. having the sound shit and like, yeah, got to replace your desk though. We have struggled in our marriage. I wasn't very affectionate as I had trauma to work through. I've done the work and and continue to improve. My husband struggled for many years because I couldn't meet his needs. It made him mean and cold. We were both lonely. We're doing well now, but the gift of submission is the elephant in the room. How do we proceed? Do I drop it and work on covering up that part of me? Why would that ever be an option? Right. Why is that ever an option for somebody to just say, you know what? I'm just going to suppress this side of me because it doesn't make them happy. Right. When you have that on your whiteboard of, okay, I can do this or I can do that. You are choosing to kill a part of yourself. That is one of the first steps into losing who you are as a person. And in 10 years, you're not going to recognize yourself. Yeah. That would never be an option for me. If my submissiveness ever became an issue in our marriage, we would have to find a resolution. There is not an option of, I need you to hide the fact that you're submissive. Yeah. Mm -mm. I wonder what's going on with her to make her feel that. I remember she described it and what her super chat was, but I don't remember what it uh, yeah, said. I don't either because it's been over a month. Yeah. Do we work on my husband seeing submission as a gift? Yes. Yes, you do. If I recall, it makes him uncomfortable. Like she's tried the taking off the boots thing, tried serving him his plate. Gotcha. And it just makes him uncomfortable. So find other ways to be submissive to him. Yeah. Lay his clothes out on the bed for him while he's in the shower. Yeah. That, that, that whole thing comes down to, it, it probably makes him feel a little bit guilty. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the way that we're raised and the way that society makes us view things absolutely dictates our reality. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and if he's looking at it as a burden instead of a gift, I can see it as a problem, but he needs to view it as a gift. It is something that you're entrusting him with that he can fucking destroy. Mm -hmm. I've already learned so much from you both, and I'm very grateful. Thank you for sharing your time and knowledge. Random bonus thoughts. I don't remember what episode you mentioned Chris being your home and Peaches being your peace, but that has stayed in my mind. I remind myself daily that I am my husband's peace, and it is so helpful. A short phrase that refocuses me. That would be great on a shirt. We're actually going to be doing a run of shirts that says her home, his peace, mm -hmm. so that people can buy them for couples. Yeah. Um, and I want to do that probably after the next run of shirts because mm -hmm. i want to do another single run before we do a double run mm -hmm. but i think when we yeah anyways okay anyways that's coming i know peaches mentioned homeschooling <clears throat> that's one of my passions i've been homeschooling for eight years and i'm happy to answer questions or lend support you can do this it'll be worth it 
Should be in the Discord. Yeah. Lastly, I know you are busy and your knowledge is valuable. Will you be offering individual counseling? No. So that's what we landed on. I, I want to. I, I want to do interviews, but I don't want to call it that. I don't want to call it counseling. I don't want to call it therapy. And I don't want to be fucking obligated to anyone. Mm-hmm. I want it to be things that we decide and like on our terms, not on, I, I don't know. I, I really feel like there's a lot of people that want to have those calls with us just to hang out. And I don't want to do that. Yeah. This is not a, let's have girl time. Right. For me, it's. If, if this is work, right. And that's the way we need to approach it. If we do these mm-hmm. calls, it, that's the way it needs to go. I really want to fucking interview Dakota. Like, I, I think that we should sit down and, and create a list of questions. I have no idea what you would even want to ask. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll get it from, Oh, the men's group, the fucking men's group. That's the answer to that. Okay. I can have them write the questions mm-hmm. and then interview him. That's the way to do that. Okay. All right. Emails called relationship advice. Okay. All right. My wife and I have been together since 2011, married in 2015, and our daughter, and had our daughter in 2016. Okay, so they've been together for 12 years? Yep. I am a police officer, and my wife works remotely from home. Of course, my wife and I have went through the roommate phase and have had our share of issues in the past. We lacked proper communication for the first few years in marriage, but I've since managed to fix that amongst each other. She is an amazing woman, and I can't do life without her. Now that our daughter has grown up a little and is becoming and is beginning to come into her personality, I often find that I myself sometimes have issues in regards to a short temper, patience issues, and etc. with my daughter. Oh, so yeah, she's like seven. I believe this is due to me not having enough decompression time. Even on my days off, I feel anxious as if I'm not being productive and I get upset with myself for it, but cannot stir the energy to really be productive. These episodes come usually every couple of weeks. My hormones are managed correctly through a hormone clinic and I exercise bodybuilding five days a week and eat a well-balanced diet. How do I approach my wife to tell her I think I need more decompression time during the week? Even though I exercise, I feel as though as I don't even though I exercise, I feel as if I don't decompress enough through it. My job is very stressful. I've been doing it for eight years. And I also run a small side gig doing welding and fabrication. With that being said, I do my absolute best as a father. I've taught my daughter to ride motocross and ride with her regularly. I've taught her how to skateboard and we go to our local skate park regularly. We are connected deeply and I share a bond that I had never had with my father growing up. I just feel as if I'm not doing enough, although I'm doing all that I can. I go above and beyond to support my wife and her aspirations as she is a barrel racer. <laughs> Fucking barrel racer. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what my mind went to as well. <laughs> That's so funny. I am not complaining that she is doing what she loves. I'm here for it and support it. As a matter of fact, my daughter does it as well with her, and I believe it's a great tool to teach her responsibility. Yep, it is. I do my share of work to support them and help any way I can, picking up hay, helping fix horse fences, etc. I guess my question is this. How do I approach my wife to tell her I think I need more time to myself? I include my daughter in my activities as much as I can, but sometimes I just want to do things by myself without feeling guilty. He said he was a police officer, right? Correct. Okay. I feel guilty thinking about telling my wife that I'd like more decompression time. So as a man, how would you approach me as your wife and say, I need more decompression time? Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say a couple things. Okay. Regardless of how you people feel about police officers, because everybody's got their own opinions mm-hmm. and, and I, I have, and I'm going to be honest about mine. I, I have a, a dual sided view because there are police officers who entire existence is to write tickets and generate revenue for the state. I have a problem with those guys. 
because they're not doing anything to better society. Right. <clears throat> then there are those police officers who have to pull children out of burning vehicles and resuscitate babies until EMTs get there. Mm-hmm. There are police officers who see horrible, horrible fucking things that they have to put away before walking home to their family or walking through the door to their family. Mm -hmm. Um, I have somebody that I I love dearly that I view as my brother. Um, I've known him since he was 16 years old and he is a police officer. And and the things that I have heard in conversation from him is horrible. I have clients who are uh, at the tattoo studio who are police officers locally same thing. Mm-hmm. Like the conversations that I hear these guys talk about, you can tell that they're not okay. They're not. They have to push that shit down to do their fucking job. They have to deal with like the foulest <laughs> shit humans right. do. And we live in a safe area. We do. Relatively safe. Like I, I don't mm-hmm. worry about you going to the gas station here. When we leave, I worry about it. But where we live, I'm not worried about that shit at all. Um, But I know that even though we live in this area, there are still bad things that happen. And there's a lot of horrible things that that are portrayed because I've had conversation with these guys. You need to explain to your wife that with your job, you need a certain level of alone time to process your shit or you are going to become a toxic person to your family. Mm -hmm. You love your daughter. You're going fishing or uh, motocross. motocross. You you did say that he takes her fishing, right? Uh, No, skateboarding. Skateboarding. Um, so they're they're you're doing the things with your kid and like you are you are creating a bond that you never had with your father. You're super close to your wife. You, you're doing the gym thing to try to help with your your mental health. The gym is only part of the self care. Mm-hmm. We 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 both use the gym. You have your bathtub. You have your skincare treatments. You have all the things that you do that's good for your self care. I have the gym, I have cardio, and I have my audio books because those are all things that I enjoy doing. And then I got to be honest, one of my other things for self-care is watching sermons on YouTube. Yeah. Taking in the word. Like that's something that I need for me. Um, when I get to the point where I really fucking need a change, I lean into my hobbies super hard and I go do them. We'll go do photography. And you'll mm-hmm. see those spurts where we go do pictures every weekend because I need that time to process and get through my shit. And it's healthy. Mm-hmm. You not talking to your wife is doing a disservice because when you start to fall apart and you are no longer the man that she has come to know, you are going to have problems in your marriage and you're not going to be able to figure out what the root is. And it's going to come down to you not taking the time that you need to decompress and have that self-care just mm-hmm. like a woman needs her self-care. Correct. We talk about this shit all the time. Mm-hmm. Bro, you need to take some fucking time for yourself. This the, the decompression time, just going home and sitting in your car for 30 minutes in silence, that might be enough for you. It may not. The gym is not enough. And Mm -hmm. I I don't know how you train. You could be going and doing fucking CrossFit workouts that are super hard on your body, but it's not the same thing as putting on some metal and lifting heavy ass fucking weight. He said he's a bodybuilder. Okay, so he's doing bodybuilding. I mean, if you're if you're lifting like a bodybuilder and you're actually doing the thing, you're probably moving big weight. I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. all there is to that. Um, But there's a difference like for me. When I'm going through it, powerlifting has always been my go-to. I, I, you know, picking up fucking five, six hundred pounds off the floor and setting it back down, or, or putting it on your back is a big deal. Start, start maybe doing once a month, like really trying to hit some one rep max, like that. That may help you decompress a little bit, but it, I think that's a band aid. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. You need to talk to your woman because otherwise, you're going to self sabotage your relationship unknowingly, and you're not going to be able to figure out what the root of it is. And you're going to come back to it being that you need decompression time, and it's not that you need decompression time; it's that you're afraid to talk to your wife. Yeah. This that's the one person that you are supposed to have as your your lifeline. Yeah. There is there's a couple of things that I am <clears throat> like topics that I am fearful of approaching and it's not because I fear your reaction it's I fear the things that I am conditioned to be prepared for as a reaction. Does that make sense? No. Kind of. Are you saying that you uh you have trauma and you don't want to talk to me about them? Is that the skinny of it? Okay, Okay. so say something happens and I'm going through it. Okay. I know what the reason is. I know what the topic is. In my past, when I've brought it up, it has been met with very negative reaction. Okay. And it's something I've never discussed with you. So there could be a a fear in there of, I know the reactions prior. I don't want to get that reaction from him, especially because I've never had that reaction from him. Right. So it is is a form of a trauma response. Right. Okay. You still have to do it, though. Yeah. When you 
take a step back and say, okay, I'm too scared to discuss this because I'm scared of the reaction. You just let it fester. Like you said, it's going to grow into massive problems and you're going to forget what the root of it even is. I would like to say that that breaks my heart every time you say shit like that. Why? Because I would rather, I would rather you come to me and me lose my shit and like us have a major meltdown than mm. you be afraid to actually talk to me about something. The idea of knowing that there's something going on in you and you are afraid to come and talk to me because of shit that's happened in your past makes me want to hurt the people in your past because their actions are fucking up my life. I don't like that shit. Like yeah. it, it I, I don't let it happen anymore. I know. Well, I, I know we've talked about a lot of, a lot yeah. of things. Like you've told me, like, I don't know how to talk to you about this. I'm like, you just fucking say it then. Like, tell me you're going to be an asshole right now and say what you got to say. Um, we are both very damaged goods and we've accepted that about each other. Um, and we've figured out ways to talk to each other to work through them, but still hearing that bothers me. It, it hurts me to know that like you could possibly be afraid to talk to me. I don't, I don't want that to ever be a thing. It's not. You're my crutch. Yeah. It's supposed to be yours. This follows into exactly what they're talking about in the email. You're supposed to have your partner's back no matter what. That's the whole point of, of being married. That's supposed to be the one person in the world that is there for you no matter what. And I know that there are marriages out there that that's, there's no safety there, and that's sad. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that. Right. And if he loves his woman and he's this great fucking dad and he's doing the thing, like you need to lean on your woman every once in a while. Mm -hmm. I think he said that things are starting to really get better. Like after they recognize their communication breakdowns. Mm. So with things getting better, if you bring this to her, you can say this is a very hard thing for me to bring to you. I've been contemplating this for weeks. It could have been months. This is me taking a step to show you that I am invested in bettering our relationship. It's okay to start a conversation like that. Yeah, You can say I'm scared as hell right now. I need to say this to you, though, because I recognize if I don't, I am going to become an issue. Yeah. And then you go in and say, I have recognized with everything that is happening in my work life is affecting my mental life at home. And I'm recognizing that I'm becoming more short tempered with our daughter and I don't want to be that way. Right. I'm recognizing that I could be becoming more short tempered with you and I don't want to be that way with you. So I'm going to need some sort of time frame during the week where I can just have alone time. You know, if we have to move things around or if we have to, if I have to wake up earlier in the morning, whatever needs to be done, I need help figuring out how we can do this. Yeah. Giving those examples is just like giving an apology and giving the reason for the apology. Mm -hmm. Shit goes a long way and That's, you don't have to be super like crazy detailed. You just need to give the example so that they know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I, I got to be honest. I would also implement the check-ins in this situation. I agree. Yeah. So he finishes the email with, I love what you guys are doing. You two are an incredible example of what a married couple needs to strive to be. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I know that you guys see us that way. I, I know you do. And I know that our relationship is better than like 95% of the people's relationships out there. I get that. But we do so much work on ourselves. Like mm -hmm. I still see that we have so much fucking work to do. Yeah. But I'm grateful that we're not where other people are. You know what I mean? And like, I don't want to compare myself. I feel bad doing that. But like, I don't know. Shit almost makes me uncomfortable a little bit. Mm. I get that. Mm -hmm. I get it making you uncomfortable. Yeah. Ready for the next one? Yep. This one is titled Help. I need somebody. You're like a personal I, radio. I don't know. Dude, that's just the way my brain works. Yeah, I enjoy it. It happens all the time. You yeah. you said navigate earlier. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a normal word. Right. And my brain went to the scene where Jeff Bridges is in White Squall and he speaks in Spanish to the guy about not needing a compass to navigate. He can do it by the stars. And I don't know what the fuck he said. I don't know the sentence, but I know the last word was navigator in Spanish. And in my head, that I heard the word and I, I don't know what it, don't know what it is. But I, I played that entire scene in my head. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's a really good fucking movie. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we'll watch that too. We need to do okay. Terminator movies too because you've never seen those either. I mean, we don't have anything going on tonight. Nope. We don't. I have to train at six. Oh, yeah. And we got to do shirt orders, but that'll take us like two hours. Help. Okay. I need somebody. <laughs> Not just anybody. I don't know the rest of the song. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> 
Good day. First off, I want to say thank you guys for your... <laughs> I said good day, sir. <laughs> Thanks. It's my brain, ladies and gentlemen. This is your brain on drugs, although I'm not on them. I've just done a lot of them. You have done a lot of them, yeah. What? It's my way my brain works. It's like, oh, <laughs> every time you say something new, new movie. Yeah. You, do you remember those little cameras where you click it and it's like a different slide? Yeah, they're the red... Um, Make view, that uh, not, they're not viewfinders. They were um, they were binoculars. They had them in the eighties. Was it not a viewfinder? I don't think it was called a viewfinder. I think it was called something else. It might have been. I don't know. First off, I want to say thank you for your guys. I want to say oh, fuck. First off, I want to say thank you guys for your insight and help. I am forty four years old, female, and my husband is fifty four years old, and we've been together for twenty seven years, married for twenty two. They got a lifetime together. They got they got a lifetime together. Everything that's happened that's prevalent in their lives has happened with the two of them together. Trying to do math. To see if he was robbing a cradle. She was like seventeen. Yeah. And he'd have been twenty seven. He's got a decade on her, right? Yes. Okay. So age gap. I love this man with my whole heart, but we need help. Ten years ago, he sustained a life-changing back injury. Okay. Oh, man. He was off of work for a year, and everything changed in the home dynamic, but we figured it out. Fast forward to about six months ago, he re-injured his back that never fully recovered from and was not able to work or bring in any income because we are still fighting with WISB. I'm assuming that's like workers' comp. I don't know. Okay. I work full time and can cover the bills, but it's tight. My husband has become so distant and depressed, which hurts. I ask him if there's anything I can do to help him feel better, and all I get is, I'm fine. I think I understand why he is doing it. He has never not made an income, and I know that he hates that I am the one that is the only one working, but I don't understand why he is pulling away. Don't get me wrong, I, I hear I love you multiple times a day, but there is no cuddles, no little acts of intimacy, and our sexual relationship has changed, which I understand we make that work to the best of our abilities. Her love language is physical touch. Mm. Yes. So, I bet he's pulling away because up until six months ago, he thought that he was going to be able to start being the man again. Yeah. After a year of all of the bullshit that came with him hurting his back, he was like, all right, this is it. Like, I'm going to be able to step back up. She's not going to be so stressed anymore. I'm going to be able to take my life back. And then he re-injures himself. Right. And now he's in pain and, and depressed. <clears throat> I just want him to understand that I love him and that I'm okay with doing what I have to do and we will be okay. But I have, but I don't have the best communication skills, which I learned by watching you guys. How do you make a man understand that sometimes you just need to take it at face value and it is what it is and we'll be okay. We do take things at face value. Mm. The problem is, is there's probably more things that are happening here that is skewing what he believes. So it could be the depression. It could be the pain. Pain Back pain is, is weird. Back pain makes people oh, yeah. do really fucked up things. I've seen more people become dope addicts because of back pain than anything else. Um, when you think about it, that is literally the thing. That operates everything. Yeah. Your yeah. legs are connected to it. Your arms are connected to it. Yeah. I also deal with back pain like yeah. daily. So I understand like obviously I don't have an injury that's got me fucked up, but I am missing, missing discs in my spine. So they're trying. They want to fuse my shit together. I, I, and mm. like I'm not doing that. Um, I'm waiting until the technology is there for them to just and like fill it back up with some silicone gel and yeah. be good to go. So what the doctor told me the last one I went to was like, bro, they're going to try to fuse your discs. Don't do that. He's like, technology is coming. They'll be able to squirt some, some shit in there. They'll go into the side of your body with a long ass needle, go right into your fucking spine and inject your discs and it'll, it'll like foam and fill right to where it needs to go and you'll be fine. Holy shit. That's why I never got any of the, the discs fused. They wanted to fuse seven of my discs together. Mm -mm. Or, yeah, I'm good on that. I feel like that's just gluing your spine in it, a spot. It makes it so you can't move. Right. You're you not going to be able to. You can't bend. Right. Um, 
so I do believe that he takes things at face value. Mm-hmm. Here, here's, do you really, I'm going to just be honest, right? Because I, I, I went down a whole rabbit hole on all of this. What I think needs to happen in this scenario is he went from being the breadwinner mm-hmm. to being a dependent. And it is fucking hard for us to be a dependent. Mm-hmm. Having somebody take care of you because you can't do things is difficult. When I had my motorcycle accident, I was forcing myself to do shit for myself because I didn't want to ask for help. That ego is a motherfucker. But if the money is the issue for him, there are things that you can do at home to make money. Mm -hmm. You're just not doing the work. So you're making a choice to feel sorry for yourself and be the victim, then actually do something. My food's approaching. Okay. Yeah. So he could do a non-labor intensive job from home. Yeah. Amazon drop shipping. Yeah. I got a couple of thoughts. Okay. This This is an easy solution. Okay. Right? I'm assuming, I'm assuming that his back is injured and he can still move. That he's not paralyzed. Right? Let's assume that he's not paralyzed because she didn't indicate that. She just said he hurt his back. Uh There are things that he can do to make passive income. Even even if it's not passive, but you could do things like Amazon Amazon drop shipping. If he has any type of artistic ability, he can start making t-shirts and sell them on Redbubble. There are ways to make income that requires very little work for you. Um, and and there are people that are doing it. You can even buy shit at thrift stores, go back and sell them on eBay or sell them on Amazon as long as it's in good condition or sell it used. You can fucking DoorDash. I have friends that are making a grand a week DoorDashing. Yeah. That's super not labor intensive. You literally have to walk from your car to the building, back to your car, back Mm -hmm. to the door, back to your car. You just go to the next restaurant. Yeah. I had a friend who was making 15 to $20 in tips every delivery. Yeah. They were doing it in Sarasota, though. They would drive to Sarasota. Right. But that's a very easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. And you can do it on your own schedule. I'm almost positive that those people choose when they want to work and when they don't. It's not like you're on a clock you just log into the app and say okay i'm ready to work until you're done and then you log out of it and if i'm wrong on that i'm wrong on that but there are ways that you can make passive income or income without actually having to kill yourself working and if you view that as less of a job that's kind of silly to think about it because i know servers that are making stupid money and i know door dashers and and bartenders that's Mm -hmm. not a hard job it's customer service oriented but it's not hard Right. And you could Grubhub, you could, you know, um, Uber Eats. There's all kinds of those things and they're in needs, especially in big cities. Oh, yeah. So I think that in this scenario, he went from being a provider and protector and being a healthy human being to not. And and like the depression of being hurt and the fact that you're not making the money or he's not making the money that he was making before and seeing the stress that you're under, knowing that you're now the provider and you're helping take care of him has made him depressed and he's not doing anything to make the changes. I, I would I would try to make him open a business. I would give him purpose. I, I believe that's what he needs. I believe he needs a purpose. Did you see where we were at? Uh, I we're good. We don't have to do another one. I, my food just got here. I'd like to eat. And I'd like to get these t shirts filled. Okay. So. Okay. Do you have anything that you want to talk about, or anything that you would um, like to add to that email as you're closing your your iPad? No, I don't have I don't have anything else to say on that email. Do you? Mm-mm. Um Guys read Choice Theory. It's changed the way that I view a lot of these things because mm-hmm. instead of being like he's depressed, I'm able to look at, you know, the situation as to why he's really depressed and start trying to think about things that he can do to change that depression. Right. And that's really what it comes down to because he's choosing to be depressed. Depressive. Mm-hmm. When he can be like, because it's easy. It's easy to be woe is me. It sucks. You feel like shit doing it, mm-hmm. but it's easy. It's easier than actually getting up and going out there and right. actively day to day working on it. Right. Could you, you know, if she's able to make ends meet, but it's tight. If he worked two days a week doing DoorDash and made three or 400 bucks a week doing DoorDash, mm-hmm. you know how much easier their breathing room would be? That alone could probably pay a mortgage payment. Could be, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I, the back pain thing gets to me. I feel, um, I feel bad for. I feel bad for that police officer too. Me too. That that need to decompress and not being able to express that and like being afraid to talk about it. Like, I, I don't know. It just sucks. Mm-hmm. It sucks. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. 
I, I enjoyed these emails more than the ones we've been reading though. Me too. Because it was, it was not poor me, poor me. It was how do I start making the changes in my life? Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm ready to end it. I'm good because I'm fucking starving. Yeah. <laughs> guys, we will see you on the next one. Bye guys.